Hello, hello, everybody. Um, so let's go ahead and get started on our next session of Winter Wonder. Um, so if you are just joining us, welcome back to the first ever Winter Wonder Virtual Festival hosted by the Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park. If you've been with us earlier today, welcome back. So this is going to be our final presentation for our first day of Winter Wonder. Um, don't worry, there'll be plenty more wonderful presentations tomorrow. Um, this presentation is Birds of Prey. Um, so you're about to find out why hawks, owls, eagles, osprey, and falcons are considered birds of prey and discover their amazing diversity while meeting three live birds of prey native to Massachusetts. You'll learn tips on how, when, and where you can view these non-migratory resident species during the winter. And there are many more of them out there than you may think. So I would now like to introduce you to our presenter, Kathleen Reagan. Since 2007, Kathleen has been a teacher and naturalist at the Massachusetts Audubon Blue Hills Trailside Museum. Um, in addition to providing environmental education and guiding outdoor programs for all age groups, Kathleen handles and presents the live animal ambassadors as part of her school and public programs, including various mammals, reptiles, owls, and other bird species. Um, a naturalist at heart and a Massachusetts resident since 1992, she began outdoor exploring as a young child in upstate New York and has hiked and explored many areas around the world. Kathleen is also a proud mother, mother of three grown children and enjoys hiking, canoeing, kayaking, snowshoeing, and skiing. And mostly she enjoys leading curious minds in outdoor experiential learning and exploration. So Kathleen, um, we'll be taking questions after each of our various species. Um, but feel free to type your questions into that little Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and you can put those questions in at any point throughout the presentation. You can also type questions directly into the chat if you prefer. There is an option for closed captioning. You'll see also at the bottom of your Zoom screen that you can turn on or off depending on your choice. So Kathleen, uh, the floor is yours. Here. Can you hear me? All good? <laughs> you can indeed, yes. So hi everybody, um, I'm Kathleen Regan. I'm a teacher naturalist uh, at Mass Audubon's Blue Hills Trailside Museum. Um, Mass Audubon is the largest conservation organization in Massachusetts and we have um, 21 nature centers uh, around the state um, about 60 or, um, or more, uh, we, we keep adding, but wildlife sanctuaries. Um, and each of the nature centers actually have something unique that they have to offer. And here at the Blue Hills Trailside Museum, um, we're right next to the Blue Hills Reservation. So the museum is about the natural history of the, of the Blue Hills, um, but we also take care of a lot of wild animals here. Um, we're not a zoo, we don't do any breeding here. The animals that are living with us um, are here because they can't be released to the wild. Something has happened to all of the animals that live here. So we are kind of caretakers. Now, what happened to them? Um, some of the animals were injured uh, at one point in their life. They're fine now, but when animals are out living in nature, they need to be able to see really well and hear really well and fly really well if they're a bird or run really fast in order to be able to find food and keep themselves safe. So if you have, for example, a bird of prey that can only see out of one eye because of an injury, um, if we let that animal go, it probably wouldn't survive. Um, so we're gonna keep these animals for the rest of their lives. Um, we also uh, have animals that are living with us that got separated from their, their families. They got orphaned when they were babies. Um, a lot of times people will find them and bring them in and very quickly these animals get imprinted, uh, which means they lose their fear of humans. Um, and once that happens, you really have to take care of them um, for the rest of their lives. We're very, very good at trying to return orphaned, um, especially birds of prey to uh, nature and how we do that um, is that we have to find a nest of the same exact species of bird and we have, it has to be the same age chicks in the nest and we have uh, guys that will climb the trees and plop the baby birds in those nests and the, the mother bird will just start taking care of it. Um, we're very successful with that, but it's really tricky to be able to find, you know, a nest and the same age chicks and the same species. So if we cannot do that, then we will keep the animals and take care of them for the rest of their lives. 
And then the last reason that we have some animal friends living with us is that some of them came to us because they were people's pets. Um, people sometimes mean well, they'll find a, an orphaned animal and they'll bring it in, you know, try to make it their pet, not realizing it's actually illegal um, to do so, but they learn very quickly that it's actually pretty hard to take care of a wild animal and um, they will be surrendered, you know, to a place like us and then we're able to take care of those animals for the rest of their lives. We actually have two deer, two foxes and a broad wing hawk here that were once people's pets. Um, so. Uh, just to give you an example. Um, so today's presentation is about birds of prey in Massachusetts. We actually have 20 different species of bird of prey in Massachusetts, but I'm only gonna really be introducing you to three. Um, and the three I chose are ones that you can particularly see now in the winter time. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna talk a little bit about snowy owls too. We have a snowy here owl here at the museum, but it's not trained to get on my hand. Um, so I can't introduce you that way, but I do have some artifacts that I can, or biofacts that I can show you that belong to snowy owls. And then I can talk a little bit about the research pro that project that goes on um, from this museum uh, on snowy owls. Um, so uh, my question is like, what is a bird of prey? Um, well, it's, it's a bird to begin with. And a bird is an animal that has this. Um, this is what makes birds unique from all other species of animals on planet Earth. If you are a bird, you have feathers. All right, but a bird of prey, they're kind of, you know, distinctive birds. And what makes them a bird of prey is the way that they hunt. And what they hunt with is these. So what I have, what I'm showing you right here, this is a foot of a great horned owl. And this one is a foot of a broad one, or a um, red-tailed hawk. And these are their tools for capturing um, their prey, their feet. There are birds that will use their beak to capture their prey, but birds of prey, and these are our eagles, our ospreys, our hawks, our falcons, our owls, they all use their feet. And they have very special toenails like this. Um, and same material as our fingernails, uh, but there are a special claw called a talon. And these are what they're using to grab onto their prey. They're gonna use their beak kind of like a fork and knife to tear apart their prey, but their prey is captured uh, by their feet. Now, the one cool thing though, is I wanted to show you the difference here. Um, this is a foot again of a great horned owl, and this one is of a red tailed hawk. And if you look at them, you actually can see a difference in the formation uh, of their feet, their toes. So the hawk has three toes in the front and one in the back, but the owl has two toes on top and two on the bottom. And that configuration is called zygodactyl, means paired toes. And that allows the owl to kind of grasp its prey just like this. Now, the cool thing though, what's really kind of unique about owls too, is that they have a toe that's like our thumb and they can move this around. Now, these are animals that are primarily hunting at night. Not all owls are nocturnal, but um, a great many of them are. So having these tools, this flexible toe to be able to hunt and grab when you're trying to hunt for prey during the nighttime in the dark, um, having that flexible foot is very, very handy. The only other bird on planet Earth that has a toe like this is another uh, um, raptor called the uh, uh, osprey. And the osprey needs them because when the osprey is going down to grab fish, um, they have to be able to kind of turn the fish around and get it aerodynamic so they can take off right out of the water. And having that flexible toe helps them to do that as well. All right, so I'm gonna show you their beak and their beaks are used, you know, of course. Um, this is a, a, a great horned owl and this is a, again, a red-tailed hawk. And the beak you can see is curved and that's gonna be very useful in tearing apart their food. Now owls um, often will, will swallow their food whole um, but with a great horned owl, this is a very large bird. You're going to actually be meeting one shortly. Um, they uh, actually take, they have larger animals for prey, so they have to be able to take their food and rip it apart. And so do the other birds of prey. Now, but I want you to notice a difference here because you have 
you can see the skull, but if you look at the eyes, you can really notice a difference between the great horned owl and the red-tailed hawk. So here you have a diurnal bird of prey and here you have a nocturnal bird of prey. So if you look at the diurnal bird of prey, um, all birds of prey have this very special structure around their eyes. That's because their eyes have to be large. They, the, the diurnal birds of prey are really using their eyesight to be able to look for and capture their prey. That's why you see them soaring. Um, they have excellent vision. They can see long distances, but because their eyes are larger, they have to have a special bone wrapped around their eyes um, to help hold up those big giant eyes. And that bone has a special name. It's called a sclerotic ring. Um, and you can see that in the owl, the sclerotic ring is much, much, much larger. And that's because the owls have larger eyes than the diurnal birds of prey. But these are still pretty big. And because they have this bone wrapped around their eye, it actually prevents them from being able to move their eye very much. The diurnal birds, the diurnal birds of prey have a little bit more ability to move their eyes, just a little, but owls cannot move their eyes at all. They are really locked in place. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more, more about that in a minute. The other thing I want you to notice is this, this bony structure that is over um, a hawk's uh, eye. And what that is, is it's actually forming almost like if I put on a baseball cap, it forms a brim. And that brim is allowing the, uh, the, owl to, or the bird of prey to be able to see when it's really sunny outside. It's almost like having something to protect your eyes. And that's what that bony structure is right there. And now I want to show you the, the owl. Now these are really enormous. These are very large uh, sclerotic rings and because of that, and uh, they can't move their eyes. And if an owl, just to give you a sense of how big their eyes are, if an owl were as tall as me, um, my eyes would be the size of fists, my fist, and they would be, weigh five pounds a piece. Um, so I'd have 10 pounds of eyeballs if I were a, an owl. So that just gives you an idea of how big their eyes are compared to their body size. All right, you can see that right there. All right, so I think what I'll do, I've got a lot of other things I'm gonna be talking to you about, about birds of prey, but I think I'd like to do that while I have an animal in my hand. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn my camera and I'm gonna show you uh, me getting the, the bird of prey out of its carrying case. All right, so I'm just gonna turn it like this. And I'm gonna start with a small bird of prey. I'm gonna kind of work my way up to the largest bird of prey that I have here. All right, now this is not where these guys live. This is just their, where, how we safely carry them around. They actually have very large enclosures where they can fly around, but this is just to keep them safe when we're moving them from one place to the other. Now they have um, the animals that are in captivity. Uh, these birds of prey have little straps around their feet called jesses, they're leather straps, and that is attached to a leash. And I'm gonna attach that leash to me and that will prevent from the bird from uh, flying around the room. And then of course, I have to protect my hand from their talons because they're gonna be using those to hold on. That's how they hold on when they're sitting in a tree branch. Um, that's how they're gonna hold on to me. Oh, where did you, you're coming right out to say hello. You're coming right out to say hello. All right, let me get around here. All right, my first little friend here has quite a story too. Okay, there we go. So this is an Eastern screech owl. Um, and this is a very common animal. Uh, they are all over the place. We, they're a very, very common owl in Massachusetts, even though you don't see them that much because you know, they're coming out at night. And this guy doesn't hoot a lot. And the reason they don't hoot a lot is because they're little. This is a full grown Eastern screech owl. So they end up being prey items for other owls and, and other animals. So they have to be kind of quiet. They only hoot when they have to, when they're trying to communicate with one another or during mating season. Now, what's really neat about these guys is they come in all different colors. Um, most owls don't do that. They may have a little variation between the male and female, but these guys actually come in different colors. So I'm just gonna show you a picture real quick here. Um, you can see that the, this one is called an intermediate because that has a lot of different colors, but we have ones that come uh, that have red feathers and ones that have gray. 
and kind of kind of a mixture of, of both. And you can have those differences within a family unit. It's like having different colored hair. So um, this one just happens to be an intermediate. And I want you to have a really close look. She's very curious right now. You can see her large eyes. You can also see that around her face, well, you see something. Around her face, she has like a, um, where are you going? Where are you going? She's got like a dark circle around her face. And what that dark circle is, it's actually very stiff feathers that are radiating out all around her eyes, all around her face. And that's called her facial ruff. And then around her eyes, she's got two, two bowls of feathers. The feathers are actually shaped like bowls. And those are her sound collectors. Like our sound collectors are right here. Oh, I know you just want to fly around. Our sound collectors are here, but hers are actually wrapped around her eyes. It would be like us taking our external ear part and just putting them around our eyes. That's why eyes kind of, owls always look at you so intently because they're listening and looking at you at the same exact time. This is how they're gathering sound. And then they're gonna take that sound and put it into their eardrums but their eardrums aren't on the same side of their head like ours are. Ours are, they have one up here and one down here. It's called asymmetrical hearing. So they have one kind of facing up this way and one facing down this way. Not all, all owls have that, but most of the owls in the Northern hemisphere do. And that helps them to hear better. They can hear in a horizontal plane, a vertical plane all around them. And they have to be able to hear, you know, during the winter time, um, especially the ones in the North, um, when they are listening for their prey uh, underneath the snow, in the forest, in the dark. Um, I always like to say that owls are super good listeners because the primary sense that they use to be able to hear is, or to be able to find their food is their hearing. Um, so, so much of their body structure is designed to help them hear better. So one is the crazy uh, configuration of the eardrums. Um, the other one is the these facial discs, these things that are the bowls of feathers that are wrapped around the eyes. And then the other thing that they have, and this is really interesting because only owls have this adaptation. They have silent flight. And this is actually a wing of a great horned owl. So you can see this is a lot bigger than this little guy. Um, and when you flap their wings, they make no noise. Now, the reason that is, is because they have really, really, really soft feathers really soft feathers. And all that softness helps to absorb sound. But it's a trade-off. These owls have this silent flight, but in order to have these really fluffy feathers that fly silently, they aren't waterproofing themselves. They don't have oils that will help them to waterproof themselves to keep them warm. So they have to have a lot of feathers to keep them warm. And they don't hunt in the rain because they would just get drenched, they wouldn't be able to fly. So owls tend to hunker down when it's really raining very hard. Now, why do they fly silently? Well, owls are super good listeners. And if you, you can hear birds flying by, when they're, most birds, when they're flapping their wings, their, their feathers are very stiff um, and that moves air around and that's gonna make wind and the wind makes noise. But these guys, because of all that softness, they can fly silently and that's gonna enable them to listen, to hear their prey under the leaves, under the snow, in the forest, in the dark. The other structure that they have, and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna try to show you this up close, um, but then I'm going to also show you a, a photograph of it. But if you can look at the top of this feather, I wanna see if you can actually see this. It almost looks like there's um, eyelashes going all the way along the top of the flight wing, flight feather. And up close, it looks like this. All right. And these are called flutings or fimbri. And these flutings, as the owl is kind of gliding through or even flapping its wing, those eyelash structures are, you know, kind of like eyelash structures are gonna completely just slice through the air, reduce the turbulence. And that is also going to reduce the sound. Um, so it's very, very important that these owls fly silently. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you, which is really neat because I'm telling you, these are all around us. They are all around us. And um, they really like parks. Um, if you've ever seen a robin in your backyard or in a park near you, you probably have screech owls too, because they like to eat the same kind of food. It's 
all about being able to find food. And one of their favorite foods is earthworms. And during the, the summertime, when we turn our lights on outside, these guys just love moths. So when moths are attracted to our lights outside our house, it's almost like fast food restaurant. They can just fly right by and grab a couple of uh, moths and, and be on their way. So they, they're all around us and even in the urban centers. I've had friends uh, send me photographs of owls sleeping during the day. And I'm gonna show you what that might look like. So this is a, a, you know, just a section of a tree. Um, and this is a hole in a tree that was made by a woodpecker. Um, owls can't make holes like this, but when a woodpecker makes a hole like this, it's so that they can get inside, lay their eggs and raise their family. But then when they move out, this hole stays. And there are holes in trees. I'm always looking at holes in trees when I'm walking around, even in Boston. And if you do, you might one day see a little, little face sticking out a sleeping owl. Um, so just always, always, always look at holes in trees to see if you see anybody peeking out. But what's really neat about this, you can see the color of the bark and then you can see the color of her feathers. So if I kind of turn her sideways like this, she almost disappears. And that's because the colors in her feathers are helping her to camouflage when she's sitting in a tree. So they're really tricky to see, especially when they're you know, mostly awake at night. That's why I'm always looking for these tree holes to see if their little face is sticking out. Now she's got these little things on top of her head right here. And these are called ear tufts and they stick up, but they're not ears at all. They actually have nothing to do with their hearing. Um, they're just feathers and they kind of use them to help them camouflage. So if she is sitting on a tree branch and she feels dangerous, she can make her body really skinny and stick those ear tufts up in the air and she'll start to look like part of the tree. So a lot of the woodland owls that we see in Massachusetts, if they are, their primary habitat is or um, around forests and near fields, they're gonna, they might have these ear tufts on top of their head to help them to camouflage when they're sitting in a tree. All right, so I think I probably should, should uh, take a break here and take some questions. And throwing a lot. So could you monitor the uh, questions for me so I can keep an eye on my friend here? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So one of our questions is, are there other asymmetric ear placements in owls outside of their northern hemisphere? There are. So in, um, in North America, it's probably about two thirds of the owls have the asymmetric um, ear placement. Uh, in, in the southern hemisphere, it's about a half, 50-50. Yep. Okay, wonderful. Yep. Um, so our next one is, is the eastern screech owl nocturnal? This is a nocturnal owl. Um, the owls that we have in Massachusetts, we have um, seven resident species. Um, that is the, uh, the barred owl, the barn owl, the great horned owl, the long-eared owl, short-eared owl, the northern sowet, the eastern screech owl. I think that's, uh, I got all of them. And then our visitor is the, um, the snowy owl. And the snowy owl is, because it's a migratory bird, um, that one tends to be kind of more diurnal and it's a lot easier to see the snowy owl during the day. And I'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the presentation, um, but this is definitely a nocturnal, nocturnal owl. Wonderful. Um, and how long do these Eastern screech owls usually live in captivity versus the wild? Well, that's a great question. Um, our animals actually usually live a lot longer in captivity because they're so well fed and they're protected. They don't have any predators and we have a team of veterinarians looking after them. Um, this particular species, um, they usually lay hmm, maybe like four to six eggs, but there's about a 70% mortality rate uh, with predation within their first year. Um, but if they're going to survive, if they do survive, they usually live to be about maybe 10 years old. Um, and then if they're in captivity, they can live into their 20s. Now, what happened with her, her story, um, similar to a tree hole, um, actually someone cut down a tree two years ago in the springtime and didn't look to see if anybody was home. And inside that tree were two uh, parents, uh, screech owls. The parents were killed and two of the eggs got smashed, but two of the eggs survived. So the person who cut down the tree brought the eggs to the museum and we hatched them. And so she is staying with us and her sister is uh, over at the Franklin Zoo. That's oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And uh, so one of her, what is her name? 
So that also is a very good question. So we actually, um, I know a lot of like zoos and stuff do name their, their uh, animals. We don't here, and the reason is because, um, because we're caretakers of these animals. One of the lessons that we're trying to teach that it's not a good idea to go out and get a wild animal and bring it home and make it your pet. And because that's a big part of our message during um, education, uh, we have decided that we're not going to name our pets and we just, or name, <laughs> name our pets, name our, our birds. We're just going to, or any of our animals actually, just call them by what they are. So this is our female intermediate screech owl. <laughs> That sounds like a really good policy. Um, so what is the most distinguishing feature of the male versus the female screech owls? So um, what's really interesting, if you have them side by side, um, and this is this actually goes with all birds of prey, um, the female is um, generally 20% larger. And the reason for that is birds of prey are actually very large birds. They, they take a long time to hatch. They take a long time to you know learn how to fly. And then they, they take a really long time to learn how to be the hunter that they are. Um, so they are staying with mom and dad for a really, really, really long time, like all the way through the summer. And um, you okay? All right. I actually lost my train of thought there for a second because my, my big friend over here is scratching. What was, it, what was the question again? My big friend wants to come out and visit really bad. The initial question, I'm, I apologize. Totally fine. You have literally a lot in your hands. Um, what is the main difference between male and female? Oh yeah, so the, so the females are larger. And the reason for that is um, they've got to be able to, they sit on the nest. The job of the females to sit on the nest and to raise the young. Um, when you meet the great horned owl, they are actually, um, and that's why she's so feisty right now. They actually lay their eggs in February. It's very cold. And, you know, in February. So they have to be able to keep themselves warm and the chicks warm. And then the male, uh, you know, being 20% li lighter makes him a more agile hunter. And his role is to go out and hunt and bring the food back to the family, the growing family. Once they are out of the nest, then the female returns to go, uh, go hunt herself. But they're usually 20% larger. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so one of our next questions is how do owls turn their heads so far? Oh, really great question. And they have to do that to be able to see. So they can turn their head 20, uh, 270 degrees. So that would be like me looking that way, that way, and then turning my head that way. Um, so 270 degrees one way and 270 degrees the other way. And how they do that is they have more vertebra, more bones in their neck than we do. We have seven vertebra in our neck and our necks are pretty flexible but they have 14 and that allows their head to be able to really turn all around them. And they have to do that because they can only look straight ahead. They can't move their eyes. So they have to be able to move their head to look around. Yep. Let me check the time, make sure we get all our birds of prey. And so I want to um, take a few more questions on this one and then I'll bring up my sure. next one. So we have um, another one about the ear placements. Um, so are all asymmetric ear placements in owls usually like the top right and bottom left? Yeah, I actually have a picture here. And this is the, uh, this is the classic configuration, you know, or the one on the, uh, the one on the right is higher and the one on the left is lower. Yep. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, and if we have time for one more, um, are owls endangered? So these guys are not. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about endangered species when I bring out my last one, but these guys have adapted very, very well, uh, this particular species, to living around humans. Um, again, because I was saying the lights and they love the earthworms that are in our lawns, they love the, the moths that are around our houses, and then in the wintertime they're primarily eating uh, small mice and wherever there's humans, there's mice and so and rats and so there's plenty of food for them. The other thing is that uh, living amongst um, homes and in trees and houses, it kind of gives them um, also some camouflage or um, protection against the great horned owls that prey on them because the great horned owls need a lot more room. They need about two, uh, two square miles of territory they need to consume a lot more food. So they need a lot more open space and a lot more wildlife around them to be able to survive. So living in um, urban communities is actually a, a good place for these guys to be, less predators, less, less predators. 
Well, that's very lucky. Um, so one more quick one. Um, are the ear tufts called ear tufts because they look like cat ears? Yes, they, they got that name because they look like ears, but they're not. <laughs> they're just feathers. Okay, I'm gonna put her away. Sounds good. And, and then I'm gonna bring out my other friend. Now these guys are bigger and feistier. So a lot of fun gonna happen right now. They are really, uh, really anxious to get out. Hello, 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 hello. Here you go. All right. All right, Suriki. Good girl. All right, so I'm going to bring my next friend here. Um, I've got the, nope, that's my other friend. You're coming out soon. This is my next friend. Sorry, I'm off camera. Here we go. Much bigger box and a much bigger glove. Okay, this is this is the Peregrine Falcon. And I'm gonna tell you her story. All right, you ready? Hello. Oh yes. Hello, my dear. Hello, my dear. Yes, can I flap your wings? All right. Okay. So this is a peregrine falcon. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about her behavior. I want to see if she's going to be doing it a little. She's shaking right now. I don't know if you can actually see that. Um, but Usually when I read her, when she comes to me in the, um, like in the morning, when I'm first seeing her, she'll put her wings out and she'll start shaking them like this. And a lot of times when I bring her on um, to programs, they'll say, oh, she's scared. Is she nervous? No, that's just her way of actually saying, I am the boss. She likes to make herself big and she greets, uh, she's a female. She would greet a male that way. She'd put her wings out and just shake like this. And that's just a behavior to say, I'm big. I'm bigger than you are and I am the boss of this nest. She is a beautiful, beautiful bird of prey. This is the fastest animal on planet earth. Um, they are a bird that hunts other birds. And so when they are hunting, they go into a, sh uh, a shape, that almost looks like a, um, a bullet. They really are aerodynamic. I can show you a picture of that dive right there. And that's called a stooping dive. And they have been clocked up to 242 miles an hour in those dives. So when you are hunting other birds, you've got to be fast. You've got to be really, really fast. So she's got some adaptations that are very unique uh, and, and kind of different from the other birds of prey. So one of that is that her, she can really tuck her wings in. I have another falcon wing here. This is actually a Merlin wing, but this gives you the, sh the idea of the shape. Um, it's more angular and that's going to allow them to tuck their wings in so that they become very, very aerodynamic so they can dive and go after other birds. The other thing that she has that makes her kind of a really fierce hunter, and she's got to be able to have this adaptation because she's got to kill her prey very quickly. She is seizing them with her feet. Um, you might not be able to see those again. I was hoping you'd open your mouth so people could see your your beak. So on her beak, she's got a structure that actually comes down. It's called a tomial tooth. And then it's got a notch on the other side that they fit in perfectly together. I'm going to see if I can get her to open her mouth so that you can see that. Oop. If you can see that structure. Oh, yes, I know. Yes. Oh, it's so good to see you. Um, so that, that tomial tooth, what that is designed to do is when she is coming into a dive, she actually will hit the bird full force with her feet. That will kind of a knock, a knock the bird senseless and it starts to fall. And then she'll come back around underneath it, grab it. And then with her tomial tooth, she'll bite the neck and it dislocates uh, the spine like that. So it kills the bird instantly. She has to be able to do that because they're both flying and she wants to kind of disable this prey item immediately. Um, so she'll do that. The other thing that they have that's kind of neat is you can see the darkness that's around her face and kind of comes down the sides. We call that their mustache. 
And that is unique to, I mean, it's, it's different for each bird. Like, um, like us having um, our, finger, our, our fingertips can, um, our fingerprints can, um, are all different. That mustache is all different on every bird. So we can actually identify them that way. Um, so she's got that, but that darkness, what that helps her to do, if you've ever seen football players putting dark smudges underneath their eyes when they're playing football, that's to help with glare. Well, this is the same thing that's going on with her. That helps with her glare when she's hunting in the sun. The other thing that she's had, and I'm not going to probably be able to see this, but in her nostrils right there, she's got this little pointy bone that kind of sticks out. And um, jet, the designers of jet engines actually got their idea from this bird because what that thing, it's called a tubercle. And what it's doing is when she's in a dive, if she didn't have this bony structure, it's almost like a cone that sticks out of each one of her nostrils. It spreads the air out. She'd have so much air pressure going down, it would blow out her lungs. So this disperses the air pressure. And the same thing on a jet engine, they have those cone type structures that come out of the middle of the engine that is to disperse air so that the engine doesn't conk out. Um, so you don't wanna have too much air pressure, too much air flow. Um, let me see what else you got that's really cool. It's like, you're so beautiful. Yes, you are. So if you look at her wings, you can see that this wing is a little, there's a little, if I turn it this way, let me see if I can show you. She's got, um, this is a feather that would be on the equivalent of our thumb. And this is the feather that they actually use to break. So when a bird is trying to slow down, they actually stick that thing up. Almost like when you see an airplane sticking their flaps up, it's, it's just to you know, put some, a brake on the wind to slow them down. She needs that to be able to slow herself down after she's you know, going into a full, full on dive at 243 miles an hour. What happened to her was when she was a baby, um, she was learning how to fly. And um, she, she accidentally flew into a building and she completely shattered um, all of the bones in her wing. And she was just found on the ground outside this building in Rhode Island and it was a skyscraper. So what they did was they, they brought her, um, wildlife rehabilitator took care of her and, took, and you know, got her well. And now she comes to live with us, but she can't tuck that wing back in and she can't undo her break. That's kind of permanently out. So she would not be able to survive if we let her go, even though she learned how to hunt, um, she doesn't have the capability to hunt the way she needs to. She wouldn't be able to get the speeds um, and she wouldn't be able to slow herself down. Um, so we're gonna keep her for the rest of her life. Now, one of the cool things before I start taking questions is that we actually, Mass Audubon has a live cam on a nest that is in the, um, in the customs house in Boston. Uh, this was a bird that almost went extinct. Uh, it was really, it really ha was impacted by DDT um, in the 60s. And um, we actually had no peregrine falcons uh, in the eastern part of the United States um, for a good number of years. It wasn't until uh, in the 70s, 1972, when they banned DDT, realized that that was, um, it was a pesticide. And the birds that ate the pet, the birds that ate the insects that were impacted by the pesticides got that into their bodies and then she would hunt birds and she would get the pesticide into her body it just kind of concentrated its way up the food chain and what it did was it made their eggs brittle so when they laid their eggs and sat them they would just crack so they banned ddt there was a lot of active breeding programs to try to get them reestablished, and it was successful and there is now 30 breeding pairs in massachusetts um, they there's a lot of them in boston and um, and they were taken off the endangered species list in 2017. So big yay for that. That's such a good story, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so you can actually see the live cam, um, you know, watch out for the, the spring when the, uh, the female that lays her eggs, it's the same nesting pair that keeps coming back. And she's had, she's laid 168 or raised 168 chicks since 2005. And they think that she is responsible for populating most of the Atlantic seaboard um, with the peregrine falcons. Pretty, pretty cool story. Um, okay, so I'd love to take some questions. That is a fabulous story. Um, so what do you feed her? So um, we, have, um, we have rats and things that we actually um, raise here. And we sometimes will give her rats, but we also give her um, 
uh, some birds, the, um, oh, the name of the bird, it's, a, it's a, an invasive species. Um, I'll think of it in a minute, but we actually um, buy from suppliers um, the rest of the food for the animals, especially certain ones that have to have, you know, like her, she needs to have birds in her diet. Um, so, you know, we, we have to buy those from a supplier. Yep. Um, and so another question is, are the stripes on her abdomen and the inside of her wings, are they for camouflage? Yeah, so these are, I'm going to turn you around so you can see the grays on her. So when they are living in nature, these are birds that like to live in cliffs. Um, so they will nest in craggy areas. So their, their feathers, when they're you know, all tucked in like that, that is designed to help them to camouflage when they're sitting um, you know, on a cliff edge. And, but then when they're flying, you wanna have a bit, little bit of a lighter color because if a prey item is looking up at the sky, you wanna have lighter feathers here to help her camouflage against that sky. Now, the success story of this bird is interesting because they are doing really well in Boston. And that's because these birds are, they, they have to get really high in order to get into those dives. So they typically nest in cliffs and hunt from cliffs. The skyscrapers in Boston, they don't know the difference between that and a cliff. So they're actually cliffs. So they nest in all these, and the tops of these skyscrapers all over Boston and they hunt the seagulls and they hunt the pigeons. So they have done very, very well in adapting to living in an urban environment. Um, so that's really, so if you're in Boston, look up and see if you see these guys, because these, the ones that live here in Massachusetts, they stay here all year long. Um, the peregrine falcons that live more up in the Arctic area, they tend to do much larger migrations, but there's enough food in our urban centers for these guys to be able to stay here all year long. And that's, again, that's the key um, about whether you need to migrate or not is the ability to find food. And since they have plenty of food sources here, they don't need to migrate. It's not about staying warm, it's about finding food. Yep. Well, I'm glad they're able to find enough food. Yes. Um, so one of our next questions is, has there been any success in banning rat poison as it's so harmful to raptors? Has in banning rat poison, there, mm -hmm. there is such a, um, a big movement to try to do that. Um, and it's, it's, we had a speaker here, as a matter of fact, who was talking about that. And they're trying really hard, but it's hard because a lot of people, you know, the restaurants and things um, in Boston, you know, we're trying to educate them that there's other ways to trap a rat or kill a rat besides poison. Um, but that's a very huge educational thing. We haven't had luck with getting um, that banned or anything like that. The, the rat poison's banned, not yet. Is and there that anything is, that- that is Problem, that is a big problem. Yeah. Birds of prey. Is there anything that our viewers can do at home to make sure that they are not contributing to or negatively to uh, their local bird species? Um, it's, you know, when, one of the lessons I always tell people is especially during the springtime, do not, don't, um, don't cut down any trees um, because a lot, that, not for this particular species, but the, a lot of the other species um, will get inside tree holes and not just birds, but other, other species of animals. So it's very important in the springtime when animals are having babies and like, you know, and during the, the early summer when they're raising them, not to cut down a tree or at least check to see inside your trees to see if there's anybody home living in there before you cut it down. Um, the other thing too is just to make sure that you have trees, you know, if you can plant a tree. I mean, these, they, all these animals really love, you know, to be able to live in trees and they, the, the food that they eat comes from trees and lives in trees and so that's a really good thing. And then in the, um, in the city areas, I think it's, you know, really just being aware and, and supporting them. You know, there's a lot of organizations that work very hard, um, the Peregrine Fund, Mass Audubon to study and protect these birds. So often if you want to, you know, donate to them, um, you can read about them online and, and see all the good works that they're doing. Um, they're, they're always in need of funding to help them continue the research. So that's a good thing to do too. Um, and then just for the owls, you can actually put up owl houses um, in your yard to give them a habitat. And that's a really fun thing to do. It takes a few years before an owl notices an owl house. Um, so you have to be very patient, but that's another thing that you can do. And then also just, um, 
you know, uh, just pay attention to things like, you know, when we banned DDT, that took a big effort to be able to do that and took a lot of public support to be able to, to do that. So pay attention to things like that too. Okay, so I'm gonna make sure that we got 15 more. I'll take a few more questions and then I'll, okay. yep. Sounds good. Um, so you mentioned earlier that one breeding pair is responsible for most of the peregrine falcons on the Eastern seaboard. Do they not um, need a high level of genetic diversity or has that impacted the population as, at all? Um, so they, the, so the ones that have let loose, there's, there's, um, there's also people that are doing the same thing with, with other um, populations, um, you know, that are more south and stuff. And I, these, these are breeding with each other. So it's like um, when you're thinking about that, you know, she may have had four eggs, um, one of them survived and that mated with um, that bird that she created. She, oh no, mated with a species that, or mated with a, a bird that, that was down in North Carolina, say. Um, that, that, then that, that is adding to that gene pool. Um, if you know what I mean. So it might just, it's like one side, one pair, like the female's eggs is one side of it and then the male's the other. So, um, and I, I would imagine there's some interbreeding too, but there's enough, um, there's enough of these, these programs going on along the East, Eastern seaboard to be able to, to add to that number. If I'm making any sense. <laughs> oh, entirely. Yeah. Thank you. That was a great yeah. answer. Um, so how old will she likely live in captivity? And then how does that compare to her, her wild relatives? Okay, so if she were in, um, in the wild, she would probably live to be between 15 and 20 years old. Again, uh, first year mortality is about 50%. Um, it's just, you know, they're learning how to fly, they might get preyed on, things like that. Uh, but if they survive into adulthood, they can go 15 to 20. So if she, with us, she'll go well into, well into her 20s. Yep. That's fantastic. Yes. Um, and so why do you have different gloves to hold the different birds? Um, that's a really good question. So we, we don't want to cross contaminate in case um, one of, you know, they're different species um, and our gloves get pooped on and things like that. But we don't want to have any kind of germ that she might have going to another bird. So it's, it's to help us uh, to keep them, you know, safe and not cross contaminate. All right. So I'm going to put her back and then I'm going to get my big girl. So I'm just going to warn you up front. This, my great horned owl is particularly feisty these last couple of weeks because this is their breeding season. And I know what she's saying. She's saying, I know I'm supposed to be doing something, but I don't know what it is. And she's just full of beans right now. So she's going to be making a lot of noise and moving around and don't worry about it. That's just her. So <laughs> um, I'm going to put this one back. I'm going to turn the camera around so you can see me getting her, uh, my, my big gal out of her box. All right, sweetheart. Now you're doing the shaking thing. That's what I want everybody to see. I know you're the boss. I know you're the boss. You are absolutely the boss. All right, big girl, your turn. You're up. see how she's going to be. She was pretty feisty earlier. Oh yeah, you're feisty still. You're feisty still. Can I come out? Huh? Don't worry folks, it's perfectly normal. Oh, I know. I know. Hi, hi. You're so mad. You're so mad. All right, you. Here you go. Hold on a minute. She's being feisty. <laughs> there you go. My big girl. Oof. <laughs> so this is um go pee. It's all right. This is a female gray horned owl. All girls here today. Um, and she is a big girl. Yes, yeah, show them your beautiful wings. Show them how big you are. So she's got a good like four, four and a half foot wingspan. She's a big female. 
And I, I, love, um, I love looking at her face because this is really just so a classic owl that you can see the facial ruff and the discs that are collecting the sound. Um, now, she kind of looks like she's mad all the time. She looks like she's like this. But really what that is, and I, I think they're a little mad right now, but what that is, is this is an owl that's too big to get inside a tree hole. You're just way too big. So she's outside all the time. And that brim, again, it's, a, it's kind of like a brim. Um, it's, it's gonna prevent like snow and rain and everything getting into her eyes because she's outside all the time. Now these guys, like I said, they're laying their eggs right now. These, <laughs> I have seen females laying on their nest covered with snow, covered with ice, these, these wonderful animals. Um, and they don't, they don't build their own nest. They, most owls take over the nests of other animals. And it really kind of makes sense when you think about it in the winter. Um, she doesn't have to waste time or energy building a nest because all the birds that have migrated and flown away have left all these empty nests around. So the great blue herons and some of the hawks, or if it's a crow's nest, she can take over those nests and, and have her egg, lay her eggs there. Um, yes. Now this is the one that has the classic hoot that you hear in all the movies. Um, and these birds are all around us too. I mostly hear these guys. I have heard them in the parks in Boston, um, but they're, they're in the suburbs. They're all through the, um, the Blue Hills, but we have a lot, a lot of great horned owls. It's a very healthy um, um, population of these as well. Um, this is an apex predator. I heard the tracking of um, folks talking about that these guys eat skunks. That's one of her favorite foods because the birds don't have a very good sense of smell. So this is one of the predators of skunks. She's got very big ear tufts because she is a woodland owl. Yes. You can see how big her tail are. She actually has a very strong grip. They say it's 500 pounds per square inch. And she's actually bruised me a few times. She doesn't mean to, she's just holding on tight. But I get the sense of like how, you know, how much she can really squeeze her feet to hold on to prey. Yes, I see you. I bet you a lot of you have heard this owl around you because they, they hoot a lot more than the other owls. You gonna stand up straight? You gonna stand up straight and say hi to everybody? You gonna relax? See, see what I see? She's like, I know I'm supposed to be doing something. I just don't know what it is. All right, so I would love to just start taking questions and then I can talk more about like her and her anatomy. I'm gonna just do it right with the questions. Sounds great. Um, so one of our questions is, uh, do these different birds share enclosures? No. Um, we, for one thing, they, they would um, like, because she's such a strong predator, she, she, would, she would eat them. <laughs> um, but the other thing we don't, we do have um, birds of the same species, but we don't put them into with each other. And I know that kind of sounds kind of sad, but we don't want them to breed um, because if they did breed, we'd have to keep those birds too. Um, you know, we are taking care of animals that they have no choice that we can't release them to the wild, but we don't want to breed ones that we have to keep um, because these animals wouldn't have the ability to teach their young how to be a wild animal. Um, so we, we've just decided we're not going to breed them. They do breeding like in zoos and stuff to help preserve species, especially if they're endangered. Um, but we're just here. We're just caretakers for birds that can't be released. So we don't breed them. Anyhow. Um, so do the male and females have different hooting patterns or different hooting pitches? Yeah. So if you are, I've actually got a male and a female. Um, I'm going to actually go out this weekend and see if I can try to find the nest because like I said, they're laying their eggs right now, but I have a male and a female and I can always tell who's hooting because the female's hoot is higher and the male's hoot is lower. So like, ooh, 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 and that's, ooh, 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 ooh. Um, so it's, it's very easy to tell the difference between the male and the female. Um, what she's doing right now, you can see she's moving her throat in and out. She's panting. And um, just like a dog, uh, they can't sweat. So they have to regulate their body temperature by panting. And she's doing the same thing. Yep. Um, so a bunch of our different virtual visitors want to know what her story is. Ah, so she, um, she's 10 years old. And she was found when she was a baby. She was orphaned and found along the side of a highway. Um, a couple of things could have happened. She could have been 
picked up by a predator when she was in drops, or she could have just been blown out of a nest uh, in a storm. Um, but she was found and the, again, the owner meant, well, uh, instead of um, surrendering immediately, they took it into their home and started to feed it and thought maybe they could keep it as a pet. And that didn't work out so well. And um, so they realized it wasn't a good idea and then they finally surrendered. But by that time, she had already gotten so imprinted on humans and she had no skills. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't put her in a nest with, uh, with other birds. She was actually too old at that point, but she was also very used to humans. And the, one of the, the reasons behind that is that birds who get used to uh, um, humans feeding them, if you let them go, they'll actually go in search of a human. So you can imagine if you saw an owl you know, coming toward you um, because it was looking for some food, it was thought you were gonna give it, it wouldn't be safe for the owl, certainly it wouldn't be safe for us, it wouldn't be safe for the owl. So we have to keep them for the rest of their lives. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so what should our visitors do if they do find an injured animal of any age? So there, one good thing about um, Massachusetts, is we have what's called animal rescue leagues and all you have to do is like look up the animal rescue league in your area and they will come and get the animal. Um, it's really not, um, I mean, unless the animal is an absolute danger, like you think a, a, a predator is gonna get it. Um, it's best to just leave it where it is and call an animal rescue league and let them come and get the animal. Um, the, uh, if the animal is in danger, it's, we always say to, you know, to just put it in a box with some, um, some towels or, you know, something soft and then call the animal rescue league. Um, a lot of times what they'll do is they will contact a animal rehabilitator. Um, if the animal is in bad shape, sometimes it'll go to up to Tufts. Um, veterinary hospital in Grafton um, and to be looked after and taken care of. Um, if, it's, if it's not a really serious injury, it'll stay with the, the rehabilitator. And once they are fully rehabilitated, then they start looking for um, places to take them to um, take care of them for the rest of their lives. And that's where we come in. Um, so we have another question about their nesting period. So if they're nesting now in February, how long is that nesting period and when are their eggs hatching? Okay, so they lay their eggs eh, anywhere from like right now to the end of February, um, be another month before they hatch. And then it'll be another month before they're actually able to come out of the nest. So it's a good two months that mom's got to really hang out there with the nest. Um, and then with the great horned owls, it actually takes all summer long um, for them to, to learn the skills that they need to become, to be able to hunt on their own. So they hang with the parents all summer long. Um, so if you actually find a nest and a mated pair, and you can, it's really fun to watch their chicks grow up and learn how to hunt. Um, and then there's a lot of, um, when we do our owl prowls here, when we take people out to um, go for a walk at night and listen for owls, we always do it either in the fall. And that's because that's when the juvenile owls, the young owls are dispersing. Mom and dad said, okay, it's time to go. You're on your own. Um, and they're looking for a territory. So there's a lot of hooting going on like in early September into October um, of young owls trying to find a territory and the, and the older owl saying, you know, this is my territory. Then when you get into the springtime or the early winter and um, spring or late winter and springtime, that's when the hooting is uh, associated with the mating calls. Um, these are animals that are breeding at that point. So it's like, you know, now until maybe about mm, April that you'll hear the different species of owls hooting because of, the, of its breeding season. And then in the fall, it's all the dispersing. The rest of the year, you can hear them too. They're just not quite as cold. Whoa, where are you going there? <laughs> where are you going, girl? All right, okay, 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 okay. Okay, one, two, three, yeah. There you go. All in a day. <laughs> All in a day, silly. She is strong. Does anybody want to guess how much she weighs? Let me take maybe. Go ahead and type your guesses into the chat if anybody has some, because that was a common question. So we have three pounds, 12 pounds, 23, 15, 50, 12, 4, 10. <laughs> So the, I love to ask this question because when I'm holding her, I'm holding her at the end of my arm and I always have to brace my arm. I have my hand under my elbow um, and she's big. She's really big. I mean, she's about the size of a cat, maybe even a little bigger, small dog sometimes. She's huge. 
And um, so I like to ask that question because I usually do get like 20, 15, 20, 30 pounds. She actually weighs four pounds. So we had some uh, correction, uh, people that were correct there. Um, the little owl that you saw, she only weighs six ounces. Um, and the reason she's so light, relatively light, um, you would think she'd be a lot bigger, um, is because if you took all her feathers and put her on a, them on a scale, they'd weigh next to nothing. And then they have hollow bones. Birds have hollow bones so that they can fly. They need to be light. And not hollow like a straw, but more like hollow like a sponge, like lots of little holes, so that their bones are still strong, but they're a lot lighter than our big solid bones. Um, and that they need that to be able to get the lift to be light. So they're, they look like they would weigh a lot more than they do, but a lot of her weight is in her talons and in her head, in her beaks. And then she's got strong flight muscles too, but they don't, they don't do the soaring. So their, their flight muscles aren't quite as developed as like, um, the hawks and the ospreys that do a lot of soaring. These guys kind of just glide from tree to tree to tree. A lot of her weight is in her talons. So yes, any other questions? Um, so one of ours are, do owls hunt bats? Um, that's a really good question. I don't, I haven't really, that's a really good question. And I'll, and I'll be the first to say, actually, I actually don't know that one because we don't talk, we, I don't think it's a, a favorite food species of theirs. So um, I've never heard anyone talking about them uh, eating bats and bats are actually, um, really, really agile and fast. Um, so I can't see an owl being able to maneuver, you know, to be able to get, to get at what bat going that speed. So just, you know, I, my brain is saying no, you know, that they, they wouldn't, but I'm, I'm actually going to research that as soon as I get off. I love questions that people ask me that I haven't thought about before, but just kind of thinking it through, I would guess that no, that they wouldn't be eating bats just because of the way the bats fly. Yeah, that makes total sense. It'd be really hard to catch. Yeah. Um, so you said earlier that screech owls live in hollows to stay out of the rain because um, they can't fly if their feathers are too wet. So if a great horned owl is then too big to be in a hollow, do they just not fly during the rain? Yes. Yeah, they have to kind of lay low. So what we always refer to it is they're hunkering down, um, just kind of like we do when there's a bad storm. But they um, sometimes if, if there's a big enough a cavity or a cave or something like that, that an owl can get into, they'll do that. Um, but when there is uh, storms, uh, we always say the owls will be hunkering down. We will not be able to hear them when they won't be hooting right now. You never hear owls hooting when it's raining because they're just really, really hunkered down. Um, the problem is, is that if we have sustained rain that keeps going and going and going and going, an owl can actually starve to death because they don't hunt during the rain. Um, so, you know, I'm always thinking about that when we have like, you know, a really long stretch where it's a lot of rain, but, um, there's a lot that they have to contend with when they're out in nature. Yeah. How long can they go between meals? So they usually eat once a day. Oh, I wanted to show you this. Um, so she is fed once a day and that's typically what they, when they eat, they'll eat once a day, but they have to digest their food, uh, and spit up a pellet of undigested bone and fur before they can eat again. It's almost like a blockage. I've got an owl pellet here. It's kind of all busted apart, but I'm gonna take out the skull because I found this pellet. They're usually circular. This one's kind of all dried out and fell, and fell apart. Um, but I found this in the forest and it had a whole skull in it. So I wanted to show you. Where are you going today? I know you're feisty, you're feisty. You're like saying, what's going on? I need, there's a whole, skull in the pellet, and then you can see some of the undigested, you know, fur there. But they have to spit up that pellet. So that's usually about six hours after they've eaten, they'll, they'll spit up the pellet and then they can eat again. So they're usually hunting one a day. So if there's a really rainy period where it's like raining all week long, that tends to be when you start to see owls during the day because they, they're just taking any opportunity to hunt at that point. If we have a really long stretch of rain, they have to be able to hunt. Um, and so you might see one hunting during the day then. Yes, I know. That is so amazing, that complete skull. That is very, very cool. Um, so one of our next questions is, do all birds of prey select new, a new mate each year or do some of them mate for life? Um, it depends on um, if they're migratory or not. So the birds of prey that tend to migrate, um, they tend to, to get a new mate every year. 
Um, but these guys like the owls that are non-migratory, um, they will uh, tend to mate for life, but a lot of times something will happen to uh, their mate. And if that happens, then they'll select another mate, but it really has to do with the migra migration. If they migrate, they don't. And if they, they're staying around all year long, they tend to, yes. Great question. So just a sort of one last question to wrap everything up. Um, do you have any recommendations of where our visitors might be able to see some of these amazing friends that we've met today? So this would be, if I were, um, just, you know, for one thing, listen, um, get up really early in the morning where you live, open up your front door and listen. Or before you go to bed at night, especially this time of year, open up your front door and listen. You might just hear them in your neighborhoods. But good places to spot them and you got to be, you know, because we're usually hiking during the day. Um, take some binoculars and look up into like pine trees. They like to kind of hang out in pine trees because it gives them some coverage, especially during the winter time. The other thing to do is, is look at some of your local nature centers and go out on an owl prowl. Um, you know, you can go out and listen for them in um, some, we have so many sanctuaries in Massachusetts and there's a lot of owl prowls that are going this time of year. Um, so maybe you could go on one of those and listen for owls and go with a guide. Um, but they're all around you and it just takes patience and a lot of listening. Um, when, you're t when you're hiking in nature, you really need to slow down because you're surrounded by wildlife, but they're really good at hiding. And they're hiding because they're trying to protect themselves. So you've got to really slow yourself down and really look around um, to be able to find these animals. Oh, and I, I didn't want to... Um, go before I told you about this, the snowy owls. So this, and this is a snowy owl wing, I'm gonna show you. These are bigger than the great horned owls. This is a snowy owl wing. Ooh, I guess I can get right here. Um, these are our visitors, our winter visitors. They usually show up in November. They're coming from the Arctic and uh, that's, the, that's where they are. Um, all summer long and then the winter time a lot of the juveniles are they're really finding out that a lot of them anyway older owls too come down uh, and spend the winter down here and um, they arrive in November leave in April but they kind of are our coastal birds so they hang to the coast so that's where we see a lot of them in Massachusetts but one of the really neat things is that um, the, and the reason why we have a an active study going on here it's called the snowy owl project and it's part of a larger, larger study called Project Snowstorm. Um, and you can go online and you can read all about these. Um, is because the, the, the um, Norman Smith, who used to be the director here, he's now a raptor specialist. He is the one who rescues all the snowy owls off of Logan Airport. Because for some, they come down and they're attracted to the airport. Um, he's already rescued 20 um, from the airport this season. And they feel that the reason they're attracted to the airport is because it's flat like the tundra and there's a lot of rats out there and they eat lemmings up in the Arctic. So there's plenty of food source for them, but big birds and big planes don't go together. So a Norman has Homeland Security clearance to go out on the tarmac and rescue these owls. And then he'll take them, he'll do blood work on them, he'll ban them, that's to ID them um, in case he catches them again. And then the really super healthy ones, he might put a radio telemetry pack on them. And that's part of this whole network called Project Snowstorm, where they're studying the migratory patterns of snowy owls and seeing the impact of climate change on their behaviors. Um, and so that's like really, really cool. And then when he's done with that, then he takes the animals up to Plum Island and to uh, Salisbury Beach or Salisbury Beach and he releases them. Um, Plum Island is a really, really good place to go see snowy owls um, this time of year, like right now. Um, and you can go up to the, the park there, just ask the ranger. There's a whole bunch of parking lots um, on Plum Island and that's the North Shore. And the ranger is always communicating with the people that are going in and out. And you just have to ask him, have they spotted any snowies today? And he said, oh yeah, they saw them on, on parking uh, lot number four. Just go down there, park there and go out onto the beach. They hang out on the dunes and they hang out in the uh, marsh areas. They're very easy to see because they're white, <laughs> except that when it's snowing, it's a little bit trickier. Um, but they tend to really stick out in those, um, the marsh areas and on the sand dunes. And then they hunt along the shore. They hunt um, a lot of seagulls and things. So it's, it's really, really cool and easy to see a snowy owl up at Plum Island. Any other questions? 
think that's it for now. Um, Kathleen, that was absolutely amazing. Thank you so oh, much. Thank, thank you, wonderful you. birds, for joining us as well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, letting so, us learn. So, folks, if you want to, um, you know, learn more about the Snowy Owls Project Snowstorm um, and the Snowy Owl Project, and then they can um, be peregrine falcons in Boston. So, okay. So, thank you so much for inviting me. This was really fun. This was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Okay, right. And thank you all of you for attending. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca Smerling from Boston Harbor Now, who's going to give us a little closeout message for the day. Uh, but remember, we do have more wonderful programs coming to you tomorrow. Okay. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye, Kathleen. Hi, and um, thank you so much, uh, <laughs> Kathleen. Um, I just want to just take one, um, one more moment to just thank everyone involved with today, um, our wonderful speakers and our, our team behind the scenes, but in particular, I want to Thank Kathleen from Mass Audubon, Dr. No, uh, Rebecca Shore, Mark Albert from National Park Service and Stone Living Lab, Andrew McCuffey from REI, and Alice Brown from Boston Harbor Now. And on behalf of Boston Harbor Islands National and State Park, um, just thank you so much for attending our first ever Winter Wonder. Whether for one participant, presentation or multiple ones, your participation and support means the world to us. Hopefully, uh, we'll be together again as usual next year for our winter programs, the Winter Wildlife Cruise and the Winter Wander on Pedix Island. I want to remind everyone that day two runs tomorrow um, on January 31st. Thank you. Uh, the schedule is up there. It's from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. with a special closeout session at 1 p.m. led by our Green Ambassador Youth Program. And that will have a separate link because we're going to use a Zoom room for that. For a full schedule and details, um, check out the Eventbrite page or our Facebook page. Um, links are in the chat. And uh, here's the full schedule. You can learn about seals, um, interpreting nor'easters. Who knew we'd have one the next day? How exciting. Um, the Boston Harbor Winter uh, water birds, and then again, our green ambassadors will be playing some trivia with us. Uh, please note there is a different link for tomorrow's session, which will also be in the chat here, and we will make sure that it's uh, linked to your Eventbrite page for you to click into tomorrow. So again, thank you again, and we hope you will see you tomorrow, and we hope you had a great day with us. Thanks. <laughs>